Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining this deep adaptation Q&A. These events are live. They take place approximately once a month and hosted by myself, Katie Carr or Jen Bendel. And we're joined by a different guest each month. And uh, I always say at the beginning of of uh, these events, I'm particularly excited to be joined by. <laughs> and <laughs> this time I am particularly excited to be joined by Barbara Cecil, um, who, yeah, we've had a connection for about two and a half, three years or so. Um, I am, I hugely admire you and the work that you do. And I'm, yeah, particularly appreciative of the kind of the the confronting or challenging conversations we had in the lead up to this event. So rather than um, the usual, this is Barbara and this is who she is and this is what she does. Um, yeah, I'm going to... We're going to have this Q&A more like a conversation. So we, we don't really know what topics we will explore. But I, I wonder if you might start, Barbara, by talking a little bit about the what, what happened for you when, when I asked you about who are you and what do you do? Um, well, my first response um, was, uh, I really don't want to trot out the letters behind my name or the qualifications that I think you or somebody else might want. Because I, I don't have a, um, a shtick or a, an expertise that I want to present as a presenter here. I think I've, um, it's more how I lived my life and uh, given everything. I'm, I'm thankful for, you know, my education and the, and the work that I've done. Um, but I think what I bring is uh, um, a response to the times and uh, and then the and a um, um, a curiosity and ability to listen in the moment to what wants to come through. So in the beginning, I was nervous when you asked for for me to do this because I you have such uh, luminaries on this series of things and I don't really feel like a luminary I feel like um, a human being yeah thank you when um when we were chatting a few weeks ago exploring what this might be and uh it, and and you spoke something similar you know the the trotting out what I do as a kind of validation of why I deserve to be here or, or why some people might want to turn up. I remember that there was a big, there was a big yes, yes, I agree. And then my thinking mind got stuck. It's like, well, okay, we agree. We agree that we would like to prioritize or do prioritize being human being over the stuff which is measurable and then what and then what there was this kind of blank space and a some panic arose in me well, what will we talk about then yeah so i i got to thinking this morning when i went out for a walk about what I, what I do do, um, that's substantial, that matters. And there, it came to me just to, this morning, there's kind of a cross-cutting theme that 
uh, describes um, a, a way of being. And I, I am always creating the conditions for some inherent potential to come through. And I, I do it as a gardener where I, I mean, I'm a fanatical gardener and I love having my hands in the dirt and I, I love creating the conditions that you know, life can come through these incredible things called seeds. I do the same thing for, for young people. I think right now there's very few formulas for them that describe viable pathways into the future. A lot of tension and what they actually need is a, a protected space to actually um, sink their tap roots down into some deeper realm of uh, guidance or instruction that's unique to them and unique to these times. So I, I'm, I'm good at, I, I mean, this summer, I just kind of spontaneously, I have a, a number of them coming from different countries and they're, I've kind of herded them into coming at the same time and they're gonna camp on the property here and we're going to sit around a fire and we will deliberately um, clear the space for that quality of conversation and uh, exploration together. And uh, yeah, and maybe, I mean, the other place that I, I do that, um, the, I'm, I've started to work with something called the Jefferson Land Trust, which is a, um, a remarkable organization here uh, in the uh, north end of the Pacific, I mean, the, uh, the uh, Olympic Peninsula in Washington state. And um, they, their job is um, preserving land, protecting land, and they do a remarkable job at it. And I, I went to this, um, I went on a, a walk with one of their leaders the other day, and we went to a place where they were, um, they were preserving a, um, uh, the area around a stream and the beaver were coming back and there and the vitality of the stream was the stream was rerouting according to a more natural path and and the birds were going crazy and what I realized um, was that um, my work is restoration and when I when I am involved in that and the feeling of it and the energy of it um i am okay and if i don't have that context that i either join into or i create um i i don't i'm not i have a rough time i'm a deep feeling person and this is a rough time for me to be on earth mm, thank you What's most alive for me, as I have heard you share, was the the first thing that you were talking about with the um, creating space for young people and the fact you said, I don't think there are any formula formulas for working with young people, for supporting them, no formulas for them. And I had this, uh, and you talked about uh, clearing the space so they can send the tap root really deep down. And um, yeah, just have this really strong sense of the earth and, and your capacity to hold a very strong container, which then allows the not knowingness, the chaos, the, the un, unmapped, the, the no formula to be, to be opened up to be made visible. Yeah. Well, that's the muscle I seek to uh, exercise. Um, and uh, yeah, I, 
I think you've named well what my <laughs> what my aspiration is, and um, and it just takes a lot of a lot of faith to um, trust that something will <laughs> come through for them. Um, but I, I know that what's happened um, over the last few years here, uh, I see a pattern as the young people come here and there's a lot of confusion and they, you know, there's a, a couple, for example, that uh, from LA and he's a musician and they, uh, he and his partner, um, I, I, he, they read something that I wrote that was on the web. Um, and so we wrote for a while. And then finally he said, um, can we come up? And I said, sure. And they, they came up here and we, we sat, um, we sat for a long time <laughs> and, uh, um, and things started to come to us. And, uh, and, and what happened as a result of, uh, they stayed, ended up staying for a couple of weeks and they, um, their lives changed because of it. It's, it's a, um, the kind of conversations where some pivot moves and um, mm -hmm. they're able to admit what's ending. They're able to feel the feelings that come with that. They're able to um, sit in not knowing. They're able to stay there long enough until something starts coming to them. And uh, Evelyn, um, I mean, this is just an example, but she she had a master's degree in HR stuff. It's human relations and this kind of this corporate training stuff. And um, she needed the money because she um, had a big student loan from going to graduate school. And he was a, a musician, but he was frustrated because to actually make money, he had to make music for ads that were selling, you know, really horrible products. And <laughs> and. Um, it ended up that both of them shifted their work uh, dramatically. She's now in charge of California native plants and he is uh, um, doing something else. And actually they just called me yesterday and they're, they're gonna move up to this area. But um, what happens is there's a, a protected point of um, dissolution of what's and of what's ending and the ceremony and ritual and blessing of all of that. And then there's the space to uh, um, sense what, um, what might be a next step. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I'm, I'm imagining that uh, quite a few people here and people watching the recording afterwards will intuitively recognize what you're what you're talking about that that space traditionally in, in ritual it's this the space where the previous state has been left or has ended and the new thing hasn't started yet it's a space of potential and also for those of us who are um We've learned to be human in the white Western modern world where productivity and certainty and measurability are all that matters. It's, it's a very distressing place as well. Yeah. One thing that I do know, because I've um, part of my work has been working with people who are in transition and this in between space is the probably the most challenging um, space for people to dwell in. And um, I think because things are confused right now, and there's so much chaos around that, that I feel like that in between space um, is longer than it used to be. <laughs> like, it, it, it used to be, you know, okay, well, it's sort of tolerable, I can hang out here until something starts coming and coming clear to me. But um, so, something's happening that I know where that there's re the requirement now is elongated. Um, and, and for sometimes a long time, and requires a remarkable amount of waiting. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a there's a kind of very specific stamina required 
from being in in a state of waiting for a very long time. Yes, yeah. And that comes down to even very specific things. Um, I, I, I've been thinking about waiting lately um, as an underrated quality. Um, I, I got invited to a, uh, um, people around here, we have fires outside because of the uh, COVID and not sure what the protocols are anymore. And so we often will sit outside in the evening. And um, I had just read a, an article by uh, Nafis Ahmed. Some of, some of you may have heard of him. He's a very fine journalist, a Brit and uh, kind of a systems thinker. Um, and he was, he was writing about um, imminent um, violence actually um, coming off of our current state. And I, you know, my mind, I thought, um, it, would this be a good place, a good setting to have a conversation about this? And, uh, um, and these were people that I respected. And when I, I got there, um, the, the guy who was hosting it, he had, he had sent the article around because I asked him to do that. But, you know, there, was, there wasn't an opening um, for the real conversation. And um, people wanted to go into fixing preparation, you know, you know, do you get guns? Do you, you know, how do we prepare more than we have past what we've done? Um, and, um, it was a, a, you know, became a practical conversation, but there were, I kept waiting for a space for us to just feel what was being said about a, um, a present pressing reality and to feel it together and to drop through that to um, something that was waiting for us. Um, and, and it never happened. And, um, I, I didn't talk the whole night. Um, I just sat there and I wasn't judging anybody or anything. I just was, you know, kind of curious about what was going on, but I didn't really, I wasn't very interested actually. So I, I was a little, you know, the guy next to me, who's quite sensitive. And at one point he asked me, how are you feeling as though maybe I was sick or something, but I was waiting and that's all. I just, uh, I think waiting, that's all. <laughs> there are lots of different ways I could go and I don't want to jump at any of them. I'm, I'm going to wait and see. <laughs> um, I will remind people here that uh, if you would like to uh, send a question, if you would like to ask a question to Barbara to send it in a um, in a in the chat box directly to Stuart, please. Okay, yes, that waiting did. There, it, there has something has risen to the surface, which has been um, kind of floating about while you've been speaking. And there's some, yeah, I noticed there's some there's some trepidation, maybe some inner judgment about about naming it. But it's it's been present for me, and it's the um, uh, the relationship between the masculine and the feminine, as you've been speaking, has been really, really present, um, and not the male and female. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe those archetypes don't don't even mean anything. They're just I say them because people know what I mean. But the relationship between the the doing and the planning and the certainty and yeah and its other side the the unknown the mystery the messy and chaotic sometimes and the waiting the sitting and the waiting yeah i just want to acknowledge that these days those are loaded words masculine and feminine depending on many orientations <laughs> that you have and um but i i don't really want to wade through all that um
Well, I, <laughs> I was thinking about um, some, uh, maybe some of you know who Richard Heinberg is. Um, he's a, um, knows a lot, his expertise is around oil in the world. And he's, he's a very beautiful writer. Um, and he lives a life that's consistent with what he knows is coming um, or is here. And uh, I, I have some, I, I wrote down something that he said, um, and it sort of relates to the masculine feminine. Um, um, he was advocating against railing against the um, perpetrators of the condition that we're in and more um, uh, instead of building animosity between sides is, is actually um, his words were instead of railing, build personal and community resilience ahead of what's coming, ease the suffering, save what can be saved. And the, the feminine part of that to me is that um, there is something to be birthed. <laughs> there is something that, that yet still will come through if it has the spaces and the tending and the nurturing of that is to me a feminine quality. Um, and if we spend our whole time trying to fix or get back to um, um, or be uh, activated to, to for new solutions, we won't drop into the the work of of restoration of um, of of actually. Um, birthing a quality of being and the quality of lives that uh, that will be needed for some people to um, see this through and to flourish on the other side, which I fully hope and believe there will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're, uh, I think we are birthers, <laughs> true birthers, yeah. yeah. And as you, yeah, as you were just talking about that and your optimism and also what sounded like inherent patience. And um, yeah, I thought it might be a, an opportunity for you to talk a little bit about your work with women and transitions. Mm. For me, it's, it, it's, I'm sitting here knowing about your work and knowing it and thinking about, you know, how it connects with what I understand as deep adaptation journeys, individual and collective, but yeah, that it would be a good opportunity for you to say more about that. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've worked with women um, in many countries in the world now who are, uh, um, who want, to find meaning and purpose on their own terms and who are navigating giant transitions as is everyone right now because we're all living in a transitional era on the planet. And um, I do, um, I part of my work has been creating the, the sanctuaries and the skills to be able to, um, for women, to be able to release the expectations and the voices and um, that that they feel about who they should be and how they should do this, um, and uh, to listen for what's actually theirs to do, and it's, it's a program called Coming Into Your Own, and uh, um, so. I guess what I would say about it is that it has been a program where individuals are reorienting their lives towards something that is relevant for these times and is personally um, what they're built for personally at the age and stage that they're in. But 
it, it's to me, it's now evolving into a collective. Um, it no longer, I mean, I'm just a little bit sick and tired of people trying to, you know, be satisfied and fulfill that personally in their lives. Uh, we're given where we are right now. And there is the question about how we come into our own uh, as groupings of people, as collectives, as communities. And um, so my, my, there is something that happens in these programs, which is a remarkable sense of community is developed. And I actually think that's more important than individuals sort of getting what they want, which uh, um, feels a, like it's a little bit going out of style right now or something. Um, so I'm, what I'm really interested in is coming into our own and, and the ability to operate as we instead of I, like, mm -hmm people used to do all over this world of thousands for thousands and thousands of years until we forgot. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's really beautiful. And I also heard you say, not in these words, entitlement is so last year. <laughs> I think I'm going to get a t-shirt printed. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a, in that shift, I don't know how hopeful I feel about the shift from, from I to we at scale, big enough, et cetera, et cetera. I also think that the notion of at, at scale is outdated. Um, for me, the, the scale of the work that's required, certainly the, the what, what I'm involved in is is depth, not breadth. And um, there's a a woman just walked past and smelt the roses on the rose bush outside and walked on again. <laughs> yeah, I was talking about scale and breadth. Um, yeah, and I, I and I have a sense as well that there is there's there's something of a pain threshold in the moving between I to we mm -hmm. there is a there is a relinquishment or even a, a dying off of the parts of us that feel so strongly I need that thing I need to feel important I need to there's a there's a threshold to pass somewhere on that journey I totally agree about that threshold. And I think life is engineering those thresholds um, for, for everybody, uh, whether it be illnesses, whether it be trauma, whether it be um, not being able to get what you want um, because things are collapsing, um, um, challenges with kids. Uh, I just know a lot of people are very challenged right now. And, our dear friend, Sarah Jane Minato says that when we can't rise to the occasion, we fall into place. Um, and that the end of the struggle to rise to the occasion, to get what you want, to be who you want to be, to live out an image um, is a very painful thing to let go of. I, I totally agree, but I think we're, we're systematically getting mashed right now. And, um, and so uh, it's a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. and, and what's left is um, much more exciting and relevant. And I, I don't, I'm, I'm with you, Katie. I, I'm into depth, not breadth. And I, um, and I think that whatever actual depth, instead of theoretical depth um, or philosophical depth that we espouse or um, that it actually does season beyond. I mean, that woman that just smelled the roses, um, that, that may be a bigger act than, um, and we know. I mean, our, there's a lot of stuff now that's coming out um, that's saying we're all connected, everything's connected, and you know we're connected to the natural world. And we're, but 
the 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 under the real understanding of that um, um, in the real understanding of that we would never ever um, discount depth as a very powerful um, agent of change. There's a um, sometimes the English language is so flat. There's just no way to convey. Um, a concept without it feeling thin. And um, I have a, um, a native friend, um, uh, an elder with a Cherokee background. And uh, he taught me a word that I'm, I'm gonna just say out loud here, um, which means all things are related. And the word is, she ikayu. She ikayu. I think it's a lot easier to feel it, the reality of it, through a language that actually comes up out of the earth. And if all things are related, and that means time, past, future, ancestors, generations, unborn, earth, humans, um, then any kind of real action that comes from a rooted real place has um, a permeating effect far beyond its immediate and obvious impact. Thank you. I really felt that. I really felt the multi-layered, the multi-dimensional richness that with English can only come from the space between the words. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to, uh, we have a few questions. So at this point, I'd like to open this conversation out. Um, I'm going to go first to Linda, but Linda, you look as if you might not be able to speak. Would you like me to read your question for you or are you willing to, are you like me to do it for you? Yes, yes, please, Katie. The okay. tears of gratitude. I'm just hearing so much what I needed to hear tonight. So, thank you. so I will, I'll read Linda's uh, question. She says, waiting, sitting here on the edge of tears, or just now past the edge, remembering the plants that were practicing the sensing, waiting, the deciding to push through the soil, to open the bud or not, with no formula, no weather pattern to depend on. In my garden, not many plants are thriving or surviving in this chaos. And Barbara, you mentioned that you are creating conditions and can you say more about that, please? Uh, and first of all, Linda, um, thank you for your heart um, and how that is actually is a beautiful example of how your openness is seasoning this whole field that we're in um, and opening a space and you're very beautiful. Um, so when you ask the question, I just want to ask you, Linda, back to you, when you say creating the conditions, or Katie, if you put that on there, I don't know, is it the conditions um, in, in physical gardening, or is it conditions um, in, um, in general, or with people, or just so I can kind of make sure I hit it right? Yeah, yeah, no. Um... I likewise am a gardener and see so many ways of finding the, the metaphors to link what's going on in the garden with what I see going on with the people around me yes. and the institutions and yeah. And so it's that, that sense of, um, you, you mentioned that you're creating, can you, that's what you feel you are doing, creating the conditions for these changes Yes. to to take place so that's that's what I'm wondering and maybe it's just enough to have heard those words 
and it will come. I just wondered if you had, could say more. Thank you. Um, I, I think part of the conditions um, in all the circumstances are, has to do with a, a quality, first of all, quality of listening. And I mean, certainly in a garden, um, the, the garden will tell you what it needs. Uh, and you know that, um, I can tell you know that. Whether it needs um, a more water, more um, different kinds of nutrients, um, there, you know, need, some of the plants need to be moved. They don't want to be next to each other. I mean, there's a whole conversation going on in there if we actually really listen, and then we're guided by that which is, you know, uh, f coming to fruition in a way, and needs needs a human <laughs> to um, help out. And um, I feel in some ways, as, as you've said, it's the, it's, it's the same with people. Um, there's a, a real listening um, to um, their feelings, their pain, um, their fear, and a listening to what, um, what's pressing in them. <laughs> Um, to, to come out, um, maybe not some grand scheme, but some, something that brings them alive, something where there's an interest, some inkling of, um, um, of life that um, would like to expand in some way. And one of the conditions um, is just a simple thing to say is, is uh, kindness. I think um, I read a study the other day about um, the effects of fleeting rudeness. And I'm not talking about um, racial slurs and you know dramatic, horrible things. I'm talking about just little things that discount people. Um, and the effect on their psyche. And it was things like loss of memory, inability to create, inability to adapt to um, unfamiliar circumstance, uh, new factors that are coming in. I mean, remarkable 30% um, contraction in cognitive ability of people who live in an atmosphere of rudeness. And the, the, the opposite of that, um, is kindness <laughs> and the kind of a, um, it's like a deep lubrication um, where people begin to breathe out and think more clearly um, and, and remember something, something, maybe something deep, maybe something, but what, um, and, and also a, 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 a capacity of resilience that is, uh, only possible in a, um, in the uh, in the lubrication of kindness. So that, that's what comes to mind right now. <laughs> simple, but I think simple things are important now. I think I'm going to share something as well about the the creating conditions, and it's it's a reflection. Part of it is what I experience in you and, and some other people that I really, really enjoy being with in the Deep Adaptation Forum and without. And um, I feel safe when I can sense, and it's not always on an intellectual, cognitive, or even conscious level, when I can sense that the people I am with are not pushing away their own pain that they have a relationship with their own pain or the pain of the world or the pain of what we're collectively experiencing, which, which welcomes it, which just, and, and not in a big dramatic, um, oh, we're learning in the darkness, not in a dramatic way, but in an expansive mm -hmm. being includes this too. I, I totally, I totally agree with that, Katie. I'm, I'm, um, I can tell, I don't know what the sense is um, that 
that knows when someone has traveled with pain and that they have let the pain in that they've uh, that there's a depth or a space um, that uh, I trust and that there's a, a immediately um, a sense of longing to somehow create with them. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, pain is, pain opens something um, in the end and befriending that now. I mean, I don't have much choice, um, but I guess we all do. We can dance across it, but um, I, I appreciate you bringing that up and how you value the, uh, the opening with that. See, this is when the English words are just not making it. <laughs> she got you. <laughs> yeah, everything is, was it, everything is related. <laughs> yeah, including the grief, including this conversation, even including the denial. Yeah. yeah. Um, a wise woman said to me, <clears throat> Uh, you're just being sandpapered by God. <laughs> mm. um, I I would like to, if Jessica is still here, Jessica, you sent something in the chat and it wasn't exactly a question, but I have a sense that it's it's important. I wonder if you would if you would like to unmute yourself and share it with us. Uh, sure. Um, I debated about saying this or not, but I um. In other DA and other places, I've talked about how I'm also, I'm approaching 60 in a few months and I'm, last couple of years, I've been really grappling with my own personal trauma story of, from childhood that really only kind of reared its, really its teeth in the last couple of years. And, um, and I've been looking at climate change for over 20 years now. And so the two are really colliding. That's how it feels. And what you just talked about, I mean, I, I question my sanity. I question my ability to go on sometimes. We just had a heat wave in New England this past weekend. It wasn't as bad as they predicted, but our frost-free date for planting is still about nine days away. And nobody else around me is concerned. No. And... I find it terrifying and I don't always know I'm smiling and I'm kind of jokey because I can, I'm going to, cause I need to sob it out for 10 minutes after this, you know? Yep. So it's just a lot. And I really appreciate that you spoke to those deep feelings and that. Um, and I, I do have a personal belief, I guess that I'm, very firmly planted on the right road that I'm in the right place at the right time. I wish that I could go into denial. I think that I would choose it like an addict if I could sometimes, you know, I mean, maybe I wouldn't really, but so I really appreciate this conversation that it has spoken to some of to that, those things. I don't know. The words. Thank you. Thank, thank you, um, thank you very much, Jessica. And I think you've um, touched on some really, really important uh, things. And first of all, I, I understand that, that feeling of aloneness. I just want to say that that that's that's quite a quite a thing to live in a reality that isn't. Uh, there's not that many people that are are there with you. Um, and uh, and frankly speaking, you know, I would rather be alone than join in to the banter of another thing. So I've spent a lot of time alone. Um, I've spent a lot of time alone in these last few years, um, and uh, and I'm 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 okay with that now. Um, sometimes I do get lonely. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say was just about the trauma that you said, is that um, I, I um, have um, 
there's a man, um, a, a beautiful man. He's an elder in, um, his name is, um, oh my God, Alarian Mercurioff. And it's, uh, and he lives out on what we call the Aleutian Islands. And I'm forgetting what the native name of those islands is. And um, they, they have, their thing, their society is one of the most intact indigenous communities. And he talked about, um, he talked about trauma um, as the effect of groups of women to heal trauma. And the, that there's a, a particular um, chemistry or inherent um, potential in, in women who come together from in this deeper place um, that without having to wrestle the trauma to the ground, to relive it, to feel it, to, you know, go through some kind of a program to, you know, all the things, but to bring that into um, a community of women that we are built for collective healing and that the energetic of it um, actually helps something to shift. And so I think what I, you know, I think maybe even you're bringing that in here has a little bit of that, you know, just let that in that it could be like some, something soothing, um, something touching that, you know, without having to know any details, but um, that this is a, a feminine container in a way um, with men and women in it. But um, I, I do agree that the, the trauma to the earth, it does reverberate with personal trauma and it does bring it up. And, um, and I, I, what I would wish for you are the places where there's this deep allowing of that and listening and not trying to fix you um, and to letting some natural healing process um, happen, which even in, even, even in this little conversation, your countenance is moving, I know. Thank you for bringing that. I, I'm wondering if part of that quality that you're referring to, which is present or can be present uh, in groups of women and is inherently healing, is, um, I want to say simply, but it's not simply, it's, it's, it's very nuanced, witnessing full witnessing without the need to fix without the need to analyze and name and understand just at this big open welcoming witnessing yeah yeah absolutely yeah and i want i, I want to say also just to you know on the other side of that too in my experience katie that um as as deep as that power is to um, transform and to, or transmute or again, again I don't, or, or to evolve something into a, a more healthy place um, that any subtle um, real judgments from women are, are also extremely damaging. Um, and, and women can hurt one another. Um, even more than men can hurt women sometimes. That's been my experience and what I've seen. So I, I think we, you know, we hold our, our capabilities with a lot of care around mm -hmm. how, we, how we witness um, and sort of our deep um, kindness towards one another that doesn't flop into some levels of, I'll just say, say judgment. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. or exclusion I mean there's so many things yeah mm -hmm. yeah which um, I have heard a, a phrase to describe again <laughs> it's just words the shadow side of the feminine mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I'm gonna ask uh yeah our own Stuart has a question for you. Stuart, are you ready to? 
this I am Barbara. Hi. What a lovely session so far. Um, so for those that don't know, I'm one of the moderators over at the Deep Adaptation Facebook group um, and dragging this conversation back to the early minutes um, where it seemed like we were touching on this space, this uncertainty. Yes. And it's, it's a very prominent thread throughout the group. Um, it comes up and will keep coming up forever. Um, and we, it, it's quite blindingly obvious that we're not used to sitting with uncertainty for very long at all. <laughs> um, and the DA space has been the only medicine for, for myself in my own personal journey for that, having people on the same level of awareness and consciousness around the, the mess we're in to do that. And in real life, I don't have, other than my long-suffering wife, I don't have anybody to, um, to talk to about that. And I wonder how much more helpful it is to have in real flesh and bone people to talk to, to have to sit around the fire and, um, and hold that space and, and talk openly and honestly about uncertainty. Um, whether that's also a tonic to the loneliness that this awareness can, can bring you to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you say a tonic to the world? Mm. Mm. Oh, I, I like that word. Um, there's a lot of tonics needing, needed. Um, has sort of a magical feeling to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think it takes something to um, cultivate a, um, the curiosity about that kind of space and being conscious that you're sitting in it. And it sounds that that's, that's what you do, Stuart, you are conscious of it and therefore you protect it. Um, and it, you, know, you don't try to fill it up or, I mean, there can be humor, there can be a million things that happen in there. I mean, some of the humor is unbelievable, but, the, um, but there is a delicate quality of resisting, um, of resisting trying to, um, you know, trying to fix it um, or, 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 or starting to rail against the perpetrators, uh, you know, the big powerful people, the corporations and the oligarchs and everybody else, which is very easy to do. And then you're sucked out. So there's a lot of sucking energy that doesn't want you to sit there. <laughs> um, so I, I love that you're that, I mean, it seems like a, a strange thing to do is just sitting in that together, but it takes a, a different kind of muscle and, 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 and a deliberateness, which I hear in your, uh, in your words. And, um, and it's actually, you know, with the word that does come to mind is sacred, that there's something, uh, a quality of sacredness um, that is so obliterated by all these efforts to to fix and blame and and discuss and analyze and what do you believe in you know when do you think this is going to happen and I mean it, it can go on and on and on and there's just no space for the sacred of uh, of you know okay um, we don't know but there's a a feeling of something present between you there's a um, there's a longing maybe just a longing together. It doesn't, ha doesn't have form yet. And then there'll be times when form does begin to come and maybe some ideas that grew, or maybe some things that feel deeply congruent with some more in deeply buried potential that is only uh, sensed when there is um, that, that protection. Uh, well, anyway, I, I'm just more, um, I. I'm just more saying thank you for um, developing the, a community that can do that. It's a very rare thing. Thank you, Barbara. It's nice to hear that space described as sacred, actually. It's, um, I've not been able to describe it. It's felt very magical and special to me. Um, once I've been able to avoid the knee-jerk reaction of trying to get out of it, and it... Um, <laughs> which is very strong in the early days right um it does feel sacred so i appreciate that description thank you mm -hmm. yeah when when we've in any space when we've stopped the analyzing the blaming the the railing when we've stopped all of those things then here we are being human together yeah 
pretty yeah. special. <laughs> pretty special, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to um, finish with, uh, yeah, we, I have one question. It's looping nearly all the way back to the beginning. And um, yeah, a participant here has sent it, but requested to for me to read it for them. Um, it's quite a practical question. And I'm, I'm guessing the answer might be a little bit unexpected, although who knows, I don't know. Uh, the question is, it's about your work with uh, young people and what would be a priority to include in, uh, in work or workshop for youth leaders to help them support, support those that they work with in preparation for the future? Uh, I, I get, the first thing that comes to mind is, um, comes out of experience in uh, in a, a retreat, um, a five day retreat with these young people, and the shock at slowing down. The the pace that they are in, according to the pressures at school, according to uh, you know um, the it's just the whole electronic world um, that they're in, and they. It's painful to slow down for them, but when they do, there's a, there's a level of connection that's hugely satisfying and a, and a wisdom in these young people that's just unbelievable, but you can't do it outside of the earth's rhythm. Um, and that's like this invisible trick to keep us in a, um, an unreal world is the is the pacing how we talk how we think um and uh, uh, the young people they love a slowed down space they even love silence thank you and thank you to each of you who have sent in a question I have really enjoyed this time with you Barbara and with everybody else I'm leaving this space with um, very deep gratitude um yeah sense of of reverence and appreciation to me you are an elder and that's really um yeah an honor to to meet you in this space and also a bit of greed I don't quite want this conversation to be finished. <laughs> yeah. I just want to thank everybody for showing up. Um, whatever happens in a space like this is a product of the collective. It is the we. So um, this is not, this is what came to be spoken in the atmosphere and in the, the particular chemistry, even though we're all over the world. Um, so I just, I, I think it's important to uh, um, honor the, the, the collective, the community, even for a short period of time like this, it determines what's born. Yeah, bravo. Thank you all very much. And I look forward to seeing you next time for the next Deep Adaptation Q&A. Okay, thanks. I enjoyed it too. <laughs>